Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey guys. The device that won World War II, the Cavity Magnetron. Okay, yeah, let's learn. Original link to the video, top of the description. My name's Connor, if you're new. Curious droid. Radar thing? The U.S. shores. It was called the most valuable cargo ever brought to the U.S. shores, and in many ways brought about many of the technological aspects of the world we live in today. And yet this device had a checkered beginning and appears to have been independently invented several times in different countries. A couple of years ago I did a video about the proximity fuse shells which gave the Allies a major advantage in World War II, but there was another piece of tech that worked hand in hand with those and in some ways was more important to the war effort. And these are some of the things that came from the development of this device. More effective than the atomic bomb. I'm I'm already disagreeing. <laughs> no, I I don't know. I I have to learn about this before I can even have an opinion. But it seems difficult to the detection and tracking of aircraft, oh, spacecraft, yeah. missiles, and even shells in the detection and tracking of aircraft, spacecraft, missiles, and even shells in flight, ships at sea, as well as insects and birds in the atmosphere, computerized vision systems mapping of the surface of the earth from space and measuring the properties of the atmosphere and oceans to monitor climate change and also the most popular way to cook food quickly. Microwave. The story of how this came to be is also unusual because although it was a top secret British invention it had actually been independently invented by several countries before the British finally created one that worked and could be put into mass production. And for that, it ended up being given to the Americans as part of the so-called Tizard mission of August 1940. This is the story of the Cavity Magnetron, a top secret device that put a stop to the Atlantic U-boats that threatened to starve Britain of food and materials, changed how the Allies took the air war to Germany, and also enabled the TV dinners of our convenience-led lifestyles of today. In World War II, radar showed the Allies what the Germans wanted to keep hidden. But if you want to stay out of the limelight, then you need something that can obfuscate what you are doing. Ah. And you might not know that- If this interests you guys, as always, make sure if you heard it here, you're interested, use the uh, promo codes and links slash Curious Droid. NordVPN is not just a VPN service. It also has threat protection features to stop tracking, block malware, intrusive ads, and more. A VPN hides your computer's real IP address, which makes it much more difficult for hackers to try and gain access to your computer. You guys can fast forward if you want, but I just also I always want to make everything sure everything you send over it, making it ideal for mobile apps when you don't know if the app is using the secure HTTPS protocol, and it can be used on up to six devices at once. Increasingly, when I'm researching for videos, I come across geographically locked websites, which are usually in the US, because the UK gets tagged as being part of the EU with stricter privacy laws, even though we left it years ago. But with NordVPN, you can look like you're from another country or even on the other side of the world. So I can get on with my research and you can view sports channels, movies and TV that you might not have access to in your country. Nord also has features like auto connect and kill switch, so that should you forget to start or turn off the VPN, you won't accidentally reveal your true IP address and location. Act now and you can get Nord's two year deal plus four months extra for free by using the link nordvpn.com forward slash curious droid, which is at the top of the description below, and there's even a 30 day money back guarantee. So it's risk free and there's no excuse for not trying it out. Even though it was in its infancy, the electronic warfare of World War II was equally as important as the guns, bombs and shells which were fired or dropped. In the Battle of Britain, radar played a key role for the RAF because they were at a numerical disadvantage to the Luftwaffe. The Germans, I, I don't think, they, they, either, they either tried to do like commando style raids to blow them up or they planned to do it. I, I, I watched it in a video, but I forget if they actually did it or if it was just a plan. 
Radar gave them the advantage because they could see where the Germans were coming from, at what height and the approximate strength of the attacking force, giving them a 15 minute head start. They could move the limited but more capable fighters into positions ready to attack the German bomber formations. Because they always seemed to be in the right place at the right time, it made the Germans think that the RAF had more aircraft and crews than they actually did. It was estimated that the tactical advantage this gave the RAF was equivalent to three times the number of fighters they actually had. Whilst British early warning radar worked well, it used a string of large 360 foot or 110 meter towers called Chain Home that covered the entire Europe facing side of Great Britain. By the time of the Battle of Britain, the Germans had realised they were part of some form of early warning system, which they went on to try and attack and destroy. Although some of the equipment huts were damaged, the towers survived owing to their open steel girder construction, and the Luftwaffe concluded that the stations were too difficult to damage by just bombing, and decided to leave them alone for the rest of the war. The chain home radar used a wavelength of between 10 and 13 metres which could see groups of planes up to 100 miles or 160 kilometers away. But the wavelength was too long to see any finer detail. All right, yeah, so the, the bigger, the, wa the smaller the wavelength, the more like accurately you, you can see an object on the radar. Uh, there was an radar. airborne Makes version sense. using a 1.5 meter wavelength in development. But Mark Oliphant, who was a member of a classified British radar program, thought that a radar with a 10 centimeter or less wavelength and at least one kilowatt of power output would be much better suited for airborne use. The only problem is that they needed a device called a magnetron capable of producing this, but none were capable of delivering the results at the time. Back then there were two ways to make a microwave signal. You Question. could either have a... Why, wouldn't the minimum wavelength you need would be the the smallest cross-section enemy aircraft that you were dealing with? Because what would be needed for a smaller wavelength if, if it can already detect accurately? I, maybe one of you know. I Low power. Then there were two ways to make a microwave signal. You could either have a low power oscillator and amplify its output with a klystron, that's a specialized linear beam vacuum tube, or you could make a high power oscillator and use its output directly. Oliphant used a klystron to generate a 10 centimeter or three gigahertz signal with a power of 400 watts. But it seemed that it would be impossible to try and create a pulsed sealed off version that would be suitable for airborne use. Back then there were no semiconductors like we have today. Everything was done with vacuum tubes or valves as we call them in the UK. The first type of vacuum tube were the diodes and triodes. A diode valve allows current to flow in one direction from the heater cathode to the anode but not in the other direction. The triode added a grid between the anode and cathode, applying a small voltage to the grid controlled the current flow between the heater cathode and the anode in proportion to the grid voltage and thus it made an amplifier. However, this method of electrostatic control was patented in 1906 by the American Lee de Forest. So the quest to find an alternative non-patented method was on, and this is where the magnetron came about. This was developed by Albert Hull in 1921, whilst working for GE to try and get around the patent on the triode valve. This used a magnetic field to control the flow of electrons, and this is where the name came from, the joining of magnetic and electron to create magnetron. And although the idea worked, it was pretty inefficient. But Hull's papers were picked up on by physicists in Germany in 1924, who added an extra cathode, and then by Japanese physicists, noting that it could produce microwave signals, and then with more developments in power output by the Russians. But it would be the British physicists John Randall and Harry Boot at the University of Birmingham, England in 1940, who took ideas from the Dutch engineer Klaus Postumus, who had clarified the theoretical operation of a magnetron. In their version, they added eight cavities around the central cathode linked by small holes. This effectively created a whole new device that worked in a very different way. 
The output signal was determined entirely by the physical shape and size of the chambers rather than in any external circuits or fields. This new device looked like the chamber of a Colt revolver, which they actually used the manufacturing jigs of to make the original prototypes with, and it was called the cavity magnetron. In this, the core is surrounded by a permanent magnet. I think I understand just as much as I could there without needing to go back and watch it again, but it's so right. electrons per magnetron. In this, the core is surrounded by a permanent magnet, so the electrons produced by the heated cathode are forced to spin around a central cavity, whilst electrons entering the surrounding cavities begin to oscillate at a resonant frequency determined by the size of the cavities. As more electrons are emitted from the cathode, the microwave frequency signal generated in. How do people figure this stuff out? What is going on? I have... Look, I'm not saying that I think... Uh, just, okay. All right. Creep more into oscillate at a resonant frequency determined by the size of the cavities. Brr, I'm doing my absolute best. I promise I am to try and understand this. It's the reason I'm, I haven't backtracked yet because I, I think I've done oscillate it. Oscillate at a resonant frequency. Whilst electrons entering the surrounding cavities begin to oscillate at a resonant frequency determined by the size of the cavities. As more electrons are emitted from the cathode, the microwave frequency signal generated increases in amplitude and is then channeled out of device to an antenna or waveguide. So it's like, it's the whole thing is to shoot this, this, uh, you know, shoot this signal out. And all of this, it, it just runs in here to kind of mold the signal in a way that you want it to in frequency and amplitude. And then it releases it and it keeps that form. This was a step change in technology. And for the first time, a People device are so not freaking smart. This was a step change in technology. And for the first time, a device not much bigger than the palm of your hand could produce a high power sub 10 centimeter signal that could be mounted into a plane and show objects on a radar screen wherever the microwave beam was pointed. The first prototypes produced a wavelength of 9.8 centimeters at 400 watts power output. So the way this works is that when you send these signals out in the correct frequency, amplitude, whatever, uh, size, that when you see the signal, there are inconsistencies that denote an aircraft or something that isn't the medium of air or water or whatever medium you're using it in. That, that, that is the basic concept, right? Work was handed over a wavelength of 9.8 centimeters at 400 watts power output. Work was handed over to the General Electric Company Research Laboratories in Wembley, London, and within a couple of months, they had a device producing 10 kilowatts of pulsed power. They also- You know those, those things where, please tell me if, like I'm trying to see if, if this is a good analogy or not, but you know those, those cool, like it has like a, thousands of little nails in it or little like steel rods in this like square plastic thing and you can push your hand or your face in it and on the other side the indent shows so that's kind of the idea with with how this stuff works right it or is that just wrong um all right so i had a general electric i'm not expecting myself to understand everything like this guy understands it or people who at the time obviously but i would like to get a research. satisfactory understanding with reasonable expectations for myself at 400 watts power output work was handed over to the general electric company research laboratories in wembley london and within a couple of months they had a device producing 10 kilowatts of pulsed power they also fixed the frequency instability issues which had affected the previous designs However, Britain at the time was alone in the war and pouring all of its resources into keeping the Germans at bay just across the English Channel, and the Battle of Britain was raging. This meant that the development and production of new cutting-edge technologies was severely limited. The British government had been calling on the US to join the war, but they had refused, but they would supply food and hardware. 
if if I was British when like I, like some people say like oh America joined so late, Can I, I'm gonna defend America a little bit. We weren't ever attacked or anything, and so why would we be drawn into a war in Europe when uh, that that's another discussion. But if I'm British, if I when I hear about Pearl Harbor, I'm obviously like. I'm not like, yes, every, a bunch of people died. But a part of me is thinking, America might help me out now. America might have to join the war. So I'm sure it was uh, bittersweet, to say the least, to hear about Pearl Harbor as a British person in World War I. And that's, that's not like an evil thing. It's, it's just a logical, like, okay, now it, maybe America will really get involved. And then when Hitler de declares war in the U.S., I'm like, yes, if, if I'm British. So it's just logical. It's not like, you, you know what I mean? Henry Tizard, they'd refused, but they would supply food and hardware. Henry Tizard, scientist and chairman of the Aeronautical Research Committee, which had orchestrated the development of radar before the war, was so concerned about the situation but he persuaded Winston Churchill to authorize a secret delegation to be sent to the US to offer Britain's most advanced technology in return for development and manufacturing of them en masse, well away from the German threat. And one of the devices taken was the last prototype cavity magnetron made by GEC, serial number 12. The ramifications of this trip were great. And of all the ideas that the Tizard mission presented to the US, including the plans for the atomic bomb, the cavity magnetron was the one the Americans coveted the most. This was something that was far in advance of what they'd been working on, and it astounded the American scientists. The British cavity magnetron was a thousand times more powerful than the best American microwave transmitter, which used a klystron at the time, and it also produced accurate pulses. American historian James Finney Baxter III later said, when members of the Tizard mission brought one cavity magnetron to America in 1940, they carried the most valuable cargo ever brought to our shores. Bell Labs took the British sample and started making copies. And by the end of wow. 1940, the Radiation Lab or Rad Lab at MIT, MIT yeah. had been set up to develop various types of radar based on the cavity magnetron from lightweight compact units for aircraft to early warning systems that were carried around on five trucks. However, the MIT British is not and the Americans were me. so concerned that if the cavity magnetrons were to be used in aircraft, they might fall into the hands of the enemy. So their deployment delayed for almost two that were carried around on five trucks. However, the British and the Americans were so concerned that if the cavity magnetrons were to be used in aircraft, they might fall into the hands of the enemy. So their deployment delayed for almost two years, and it wasn't until 1943 that they were used by bombers over land. What about this, guys? I, I know it's going to be dangerous to have an explosion that's like its purpose is to explode if any big impact, but why, if you're really worried about it, what if you encase something like this within something that will detonate if it goes through, well, then that might kill the people on board. Maybe a small enough detonation that would destroy this piece of technology you don't want falling in the enemy's hands on impact. I'm just thinking of this now. This might be very stupid. But just kind of putting it in there so that if it, you know what I mean, if it crashes, boom, the little piece of important technology blows up. And it wasn't until 1943 that they were used by bombers over land. Much like the early proximity fuse shells, they were limited to use over the sea in the Battle of the Atlantic, as there was little chance of a downed aircraft being recovered by the enemy. And later by RAF Point. night fighters operating over the British mainland and English Channel. By 1942, the effect on the war with the new radar was becoming dramatic in a good way for the Allies, and in a rather worse way for the Germans, with one of the biggest effects on the U-boat fleets or wolf packs which operated in the Atlantic and had sunk millions of tons of Allied shipping. Now Allied aircraft using information from recently broken Enigma codes could search in all weathers to look for the conning towers of surfaced U-boats, 
and either attack them directly or warn the convoys where the U-boats were. The Allies also knew that the U-boats had to return to base at some point, and these were mostly on the Atlantic coast of occupied France. During these trips close to the coast, the U-boats surfaced to replenish their air supply and recharge their batteries from diesel generators, something which they did under cover of darkness. Using the new aircraft-mounted radar, the British Coastal Command would look for U-boats returning to and from their highly armoured submarine pens under cover of darkness and attack them, something which caught them by complete surprise. Soon it became apparent to the Germans that just getting in and out of their submarine bases was now far more dangerous, and as their losses mounted, in late 1943, Admiral Dönitz was forced to scale back the U-boat attacks, from which they never recovered. Dönitz once boasted that an aircraft can no more kill a submarine than a cow can kill a mole, something that the new aircraft mounted radar was proving very wrong. What? What? The strange thing. Why? Why a cow killing a mole? Why? Why is that so crazy? I don't want to get stuck on that phrase but uh, a cow killing a mole thing that the new aircraft mounted radar was proving very wrong the strange thing is that at the beginning of the war the germans were leaders in radar technology but through a decision made directly by hitler after the fall of france and his confidence that the german army could crush any opposition which was backed up by the head of a luftwaffe hermann goering he decreed that no scientific research was to be undertaken unless a conclusive result could be guaranteed within a year. I swear, the, the conquering of France by the Germans in World War II might have been too successful because it made Hitler and Germany, it just seems like it made him too confident. Um, yeah, I don't know. The German High Command, a result could be guaranteed within a year. The German High Command just didn't believe that any kind of radar that the Allies would use could have much of an impact on the German forces. This would unknowingly put them at a considerable disadvantage just as the Allies were boosting their research. The British H2S radar was the first blind targeting radar capable of finding targets on the ground without visual assistance and allowing much more accurate bombing even when the target was obscured by cloud this use okay my original kind of disbelief that it could be more significant than the atomic bomb might be this might be sounding like more sense i don't want to die on this hill of like is it more isn't is it more crucial Maybe, maybe because of the time the atomic bomb was created, it, it, you know, and deployed, it was like, you know, Germany was, I'm not sure if, yeah, I'm sure they already surrendered at that point where the atomic bombs were dropped. I'm, I'm almost positive. It, it would make sense. But I mean, if, if you offered me a gravity magnetron in the beginning of the war or a nuclear bomb, I think I'm going to take the nuclear bomb, but... Uh, this is insanely. Uh, it makes sense why. Uh, why this this. It's called the device that won World War Two. Used a cavity magnetron and a rotating dish mounted in the nose of the aircraft. Oh, and was uh, uh. Are capable of finding targets on the ground without visual assistance and allowing much more accurate bombing, even when the target was obscured by cloud. This used a cavity magnetron and a rotating dish mounted in the nose of the aircraft and was first used in January 1943. A few nights later, a Stirling bomber with an H2S onboard radar crashed near Rotterdam. The radar system was discovered intact by technicians working for Telefunken when the self-destruct explosive failed to go off. The Germans already knew about the principle. Okay, so they did do that. Did I miss that? destruct explosive failed to go off. The Germans already knew about the principle of the cavity magnetron based on work published in Leningrad in 1936 and concluded that the British design was similar to the Russian one, but their failure to follow up on it and develop their own microwave radar had given the Allies the upper hand. 
In 1945, after the war, a German replica of a British H2S radar was sent back to Britain for analysis and found that it was an almost identical copy of the first British version, with some errors. But it was not used in combat operations. This wasn't because the German technology was inferior, but it highlighted the difference in how German scientists worked, or rather didn't work well, with the high command. Whilst radar became fully integrated into the Allied forces, in the German forces it was almost non-existent. Microwave gun-laying radars used along with the newly developed proximity fuse not only made the big Allied battleship guns much more accurate, but also the anti-aircraft guns for attacking aircraft. During the V-1 flying bomb attacks on London, British radar-controlled anti-aircraft batteries using proximity fuse shells were credited with taking down many of the flying bombs before they reached their target. The Allied use of radar based on the cavity magnetron would have a major impact on the air war with the Luftwaffe, and although it continues to be used in some radar systems, due to the output signal changing from pulse to pulse in both frequency and phase, the cavity magnetron was replaced by high power klystrons and travelling wave tubes for systems that required highly accurate, high powered pulsed outputs. But it wasn't the end of the story for this device. After the war, Percy Spencer, an American inventor and engineer Raytheon. working for Raytheon, noticed that a chocolate bar he had in his pocket had melted when he approached a I heard about this. This is how the microwave. Raytheon laboratories. Although he didn't know it at the time, he suspected that it had something to do with the microwaves it was generating. He started experimenting by holding a bag of popcorn kernels in front of a magnetron and watched as they popped in the bag. After a lot of effort, he filed a patent for the world's first microwave oven on October the 18th, 1945. And although it took 20 years to come down not only in price but also in size, it started the revolution that would lead to the convenience cooking that we take for granted today. Today there are over 1 billion cavity magnetrons in use powering microwave ovens in the majority of kitchens around the world. And I wonder if the inventors of those first magnetrons could have realized just how it would change the world for an altogether more peaceful purpose. So thanks for watching and don't forget to thumbs up, share and subscribe and I'll see you in the next video. It's one of the scary truths that I'm starting to realize is that a lot of technology that makes common everyday life um, easier is as a result of more wartime inventions that I, I wonder if war is clearly an awful thing, but you cannot deny its, excuse me, sorry, its ability to incentivize new technologies because it's a life or death thing. There's nothing else that can make people want to invent certain things more than that. And then it, it translates into things that in peacetime we might not have had if not for war. So I guess sometimes bright side things, I don't, I don't know. I hope you guys are all doing well. would appreciate any comments down below, any answers to my questions, any comments at all. We'd love for you to like and subscribe, and hopefully I'll see you next video. Bye, guys.